All right, so let's continue and dive in to start learning some of those brain structures and a bit about what they do and how they work together to create the complex behavior that we exhibit daily. We said we have the frontal, parietal, temporal, and occipital lobes, and I pointed out the brainstem and the cerebellum. I want to take a look at a cross-section of the brain and point out what's perhaps the biggest dichotomy in the entire brain, and that's white and gray matter. So let's look. So this slice, well, I guess I'll just show you. So this slice of the brain came from over here. So if you can see that. So quick quiz, what kind of slice is this? Go beyond just the cross section, tell me, well really yell at your computer, where it came from. It's from the right hemisphere near the top of the brain. It's a horizontal slice, so it's a right superior horizontal slice. Like I said, these words are interchangeable, so you could also say it's a right dorsal axial slice if you wanted. There's no difference. Okay, so let's take a look. Uh, I guess we'll go with this one. This, this looks good. So there's some gray stuff on the outside, and there's some light gray stuff on the inside. We call this brain stuff gray and white matter, because it gets confusing to talk about grays and light grays. Now, there are some explicit anatomical differences in what makes up the gray and white matter. If you know a little bit about neuroscience, or if you've watched one of my other videos, you know that neurons have cell bodies, dendrites, and axons. The cell bodies and dendrites of neurons reside in gray matter, and since they are all gray, this region appears gray. You can see that the gray matter is all on the outside of the brain, and the white matter is in between that. For the most part, almost all the neuron bodies of the brain reside on the outside of it, with connecting axons in between. For this reason, we call this gray matter cortex, which means bark in Latin. We apply different prefixes depending on where the cortex is found. For example, this gray matter is found in the cerebrum. That's what we call this large part of the brain, so it's called cerebral cortex. It's also called neocortex because it evolved most recently compared to other types of cortex. Now, down here in the cerebellum, gray matter is referred to as cerebellar cortex, and in the hippocampus and olfactory bulbs, we'll find allocortex. These different types of cortex actually have different numbers of layers and structures, so these distinctions are important, not just arbitrary. So you can see right away that the neocortex is very wrinkly. It has these sort of inny parts and outy parts, uh, and you can see the outy parts from the surface of the brain. Uh, we call these valleys of gray matter, so these right here, uh, sulci or sulcus for singular use. And the tops that you can see, sort of like mountains, we call the surface gyri or gyrus. These are also important words for referencing areas of the brain. Uh, I might say the superior temporal gyrus, and I'm referring to a particular gyrus on the upper temporal lobe, uh, sort of sort of right here. Uh, or I might say temporal sulcus, which is this huge valley. And, and actually, I'll, I'll show this to you. Um, so this, you can see this sort of, well, let's see, this sort of comes off, and there's cortex. There's actually this really, really big valley right there. And this is something to mention, because human brains are actually very similar to each other. And these gyri and sulci, uh, they're sort of like these landmarks that you can refer to because they're consistent across all human brains. White matter, moving on to white matter. So it's primarily made up of the axons of cells. Now, when you're projecting an axon across a really large region of the brain, you want to ensure that the electrical signal doesn't die out before it reaches the receiving neuron. So you wrap an insulator around your axon. This insulator is called myelin. It's just a fatty substance that sort of wraps around long axons in bunches. And it's this myelin that gives white matter its lighter appearance in the brain. So the next thing we're going to talk about is the corpus callosum. So many of these axons will cross over to the other side of the brain. And what's the best thing? I'll show you guys this. So there's this dense cluster. I'm not quite sure if you can see it, but right in here, there's some white matter right there. It's this really dense cluster of axons that goes between the two brain hemispheres, and it's known as the corpus callosum. It acts like a bridge between the left and right sides of the brain. If you lesion the corpus callosum, as actually we have here in the dissection, just cut along that line right there, using uh, a procedure known as a callosotomy, you produce what we call split-brain patients. They are able to pass small amounts of data between the hemispheres over much smaller crossings of axons, but for the most part, 
their two hemispheres operate separately. We'll talk more about split brain patients later, so hold on to that thought, but it's really, really interesting stuff. Let's talk about hemisphere specificity for a moment. For example, language is almost always processed on the left side of the brain, in the superior temporal lobe and lateral frontal lobe. So, superior temporal. If we turn the brain on its side, which uh, is actually no easy task, uh, but the superior temporal lobe is right here, and the lateral frontal lobe is going to be right around here. About 97% of right-handed people process language in the left side of the brain, and more than 50% of left-handed people do too. Though there is some variance, sometimes it's found on the right side. Let me actually take uh, a short detour to expand on language a bit, and yeah, then I'll get back to, to, to split-brain patients. We know of two important sites for language in the brain, known as Broca's area and Wernicke's area, named after Paul Broca and Carl Wernicke. These scientists studied individuals with lesions to these areas who suffered from difficulties with speech. Broca's patient, known as patient Tan, is famously known for being able to say only one word, Tan. He sounded a bit like a Pokemon would be. While most textbooks don't mention it, patient Tan was also very good at swearing, but, you know, patient Tan sounds better than patient <laughs> Broca's aphasia, damage to Broca's area, caused an inability to produce language, like patient Tan. Patients can't speak fluently or name objects, but they can clearly understand what others are saying and know what these items are. If you ask them what something is, they'll try really hard to answer, and if you give them multiple choice, they'll nod the correct, the correct name with no problem. Interestingly, Broca's aphasics can sing well-known songs. It seems that these songs are known as a series of motor commands to produce the, language, to produce the song, and they don't require language production. Wernicke's aphasia, on the other hand, produces an inability to understand language. Wernicke's aphasics will happily ramble on and on about nonsense, and they'll even answer your questions and carry on a conversation, but the responses are just so nonsensical, they're almost humorous. Alright, let's return now to those really interesting split-brain subjects with lesions to the corpus callosum. If you ask a split-brain patient to name an object seen on the left side of their visual field, they're unable to, but if you ask them how to use it, they have no problem demonstrating. If you move the object to the right side, they can now name the object. This is because vision, like most sensations, is processed on the opposite side of the brain as it was perceived. So, the image on the object on the left is sent to the right side of the brain. But then, once it's there, the data can't make it back over to the left side for language processing because the corpus callosum is cut in these patients. The patient still knows what the object is, but they just don't know the word for it without being able to access language processing on the other side of the brain. But if you display it on the right, it gets sent to the left side of the brain, and it can access language processing.